messages that the Lord kind of dictated and it's a message about hope and so I'm asking Father this morning that he would open our hearts in a fresh way that we'd really be able to hear him in a fresh way that we something would spark that, that something would flip over all right so if you got your Bibles there's basically three passages that I want to read before I begin Romans 5 Three through five. He said, and not only this, but we exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Hope does not disappoint. First Timothy 1 Timothy 18. And these won't sound like they come together, but they do. This command I entrust to you, Timothy. This is Paul writing. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight. In 2 Timothy 1.6, For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now, over the years, you've heard me talk a lot about various moves of, of God that I've lived through and that many of you have shared. Some of you have lived through several moves of God. There was the charismatic renewal in the 1960s and 1970s that released the Holy Spirit into the mainline denominations that my family was part of and that they helped pioneer. Before that move of the Spirit took root, people went to church every Sunday to pick up hymnals and sing three old hymns to an organ or a piano. Instead of flowing from song to song, it was, please turn in your hymnals to, Psalm, to, to number 125, and we'll sing the first and the fourth verses. I mean, how many remember that? Yeah, right. So you'd sing it to an organ or a piano, read a responsive reading from page 325, and then you'd hear a 20-minute sermon. When the renewal broke out, a whole lot of people found out that Jesus is alive. All of a sudden, Presbyterians and Methodists and Catholics and Episcopalians and a lot of others were being filled with the Holy Spirit and they were speaking in tongues. Prophetic ministry then became a thing in mainline denominations. And healing ministry flourished. Books were written about healing ministry and how to do it. And inner healing got born as a, as a, as a revelation to and we was like, hey, God heals physically. Hey, he heals inwardly too. I mean, that's how that phrase got birthed. And the leaders of all the denominational renewal movements came together for joint events. And so you had Catholics and Episcopalians and Methodists and Congregationalists and Lutherans and, and Pentecostals, all of them gathered around together around a hunger for Jesus. It was a controversial minority in those mainline denominations, but but it happened. It happened. And then the Jesus movement broke out around 1969 and swept hundreds of thousands of, of, of young people into a relationship with Jesus. And at least the beginning of it was marked, the beginning at least, was marked by signs and wonders. The movement of God's Spirit and people getting baptized in the Spirit and singing and you know, speaking in tongues and, and stuff. The Holy Spirit was moving. And then after that came the vineyard. And the vineyard was all about power evangelism. Let's go do signs and wonders in the street, win people to the Lord that way. It was about healing. And there was a new stream of worship music. And the idea was, the message was that every minister, I mean, every, every, every believer could minister the power. A lot of the theme in the vineyard was equipping the saints, and it spread all around the world. And then came the Toronto blessing. Gosh, do you think God wants to get through to us? Then came the Toronto blessing, and there were all those, that was 1994, and there were all those powerful manifestations of the presence of God that just went off the charts. Nobody had seen anything like it. Father's heart, Father's love was, at, was at, the, at the foundation of that. And again, there were churches all over the world planted and touched. And now there's Bethel and the message of the kingdom of God, Bethel Redding. In the mainline denomination I grew up in and that I was originally ordained in, 
I was a leader in the National Renewal Group. And for a while, I was part of the vineyard, and probably, for probably 14 years, I served on the International Input Council for the church affiliation that came out of the Toronto Revival. And I loved it all. I was drawn to all of it. But the truth is, I never really felt that I truly belonged, never felt that I really fit in with any of those groups, and I always wondered why. And God gave me an answer recently that has to do with hope. I'm sharing all that because I know there are a lot of you that have felt the same way as the years have passed. So I hope you can identify with what I'm saying. When people get older, they tend to look backward to what happened in their past. Sometimes it's old hurts or old pains. But in those of us who live through those moves of God that were wonderful, there's a tendency to look at back, to, to look back at, at what was back then and, and remember and tell the stories. And there's even talk in renewal circles that I've heard as I travel. There's talk about going back and redigging old wells where revival once happened so that we can get back what happened back then and experience it all over again. Well, the young aren't interested in any of that. All they want to know is what is God doing now? And they want to experience that. They're not drinking from the past. They're not drinking from memories of what was. They want to live in what's coming. What's on the horizon? Where is God going? Not looking back, they're looking forward. I don't believe God wants to redig any old wells. I think he wants to release new ones. I think he wants to release fresh ones. I think he wants to release the new song. Looking forward. God will never take us backward. Hope isn't in the past. Hope is an issue right now, isn't it? Hope is not in the past. God will never take us backward. Hope lies before us. Hope looks forward. Now, I'm not sure whether hope draws us into the future or whether, uh, or, or whether it draws the future into us. And I don't really care. I just know that hope is forward-looking and that hope doesn't feed on the past. And it's not that we can't learn from the past. We just can't live from the past. If hope comes from the past, then all those dead mainline denominations would still be living in the revivals they were birthed in. Hope is a major issue for people today, especially among older ones, but youth as well. I'm hearing hopelessness come from our youth. It's an epidemic. There's been a, a war on faith that's been waged publicly. There's a war on God's principles. It's waged in schools, colleges, universities, courtrooms. Take out the sense of a transcendent God. All that's left is purposelessness. No hope. What's life about? Why am I here? But I'm telling you, this is, this is what I'm talking about. This is fertile ground for us who believe. It's a golden hour for us to do what we've been called to do and be. I got a revelation last week as to why an old guy, as an old guy, I never did fit in. I never felt like I felt like I, I mean, I participated, I loved it, but I never felt like I fit in any of those past movements as much as I loved them. Why do I now not look back at those movements and long for something that was? Because I don't, I don't want to go back. I don't long for anything that was. I don't want to pull the past into the present. And what God told me was this. He said, never feeling like I fit in, never feeling like I belonged was because he had reserved me for what was to come. He's reserved me for what's to come. What's really mine hasn't happened yet. I've been reserved for such a time as this. And I know that a whole lot of you older ones here are in that same place. You lived it, but you never really fit in. You know there was a, maybe, maybe you know there was a destiny set for you, but you have this sense that you've never gotten to it. 
And that's why I've shared what I've shared. You enjoyed what was, but you never really fit. Or at least you don't ever really want to go back. You've been reserved for what's to come. What's actually yours, a move of God in which you truly belong. That lies before you. Your true destiny has yet to unfold. But you've struggled with hope because there have been so many disappointments. And there have been so many times that some prophetic fool like me has said that it's just around the corner. It's coming. It's, it's, it's just in front of us, but it seems to be delayed. And so there's this vague sense of disappointment, not just with God, not just with faith, not just with church, but with life itself. And it's really not your fault. There's nothing wrong with you. Some of you haven't lived long enough for what I've just described. Or maybe you haven't been Christian long enough to know what I'm talking about. Or maybe those moves of God just didn't reach you. Maybe somehow they bypassed you. You don't have that kind of old, you, you never experienced that kind of old renewal or move of God that you could look back to. But there are issues of hope in your life just the same. And so I'll say it again, the same thing. There's nothing wrong with you, but you need to know, just as the older ones need to know, that you were born for such a time as this. In the same way, you've been reserved for such a time as this. If you don't have those renewal times to look back to, then it's time for you to light up. It's time for you to kindle what God has given you now. For the older ones, it's don't try to recreate something that was. Move into the future. Move into something new that your past has prepared you for. You've been reserved by God for such a time as this. God says, light the burner. It's still there for the older ones. It's still there for those who don't have that history. It's waiting, even for those who don't have that history, it's waiting for the match to ignite it. Romans eleven twenty nine. 29, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Whatever you did in the past that was gifted, if you stopped doing it, you still have it. And it's time to fire it up now. Pick it up. Light the fire again. What God has given us can't be taken away. It, it can't even be measured. The love, the power for healing, the power for changing the lives of everybody we touch, power and anointing for restoring cities and workplaces and neighborhoods. This is what we're called to do. The move of God is coming and it's not a repeat. And it's not an old well. It's not a rehash. It's a fresh flood springing up that carries everything God has reserved for us, whether we're young or whether we're old. Veterans of past movements and newbies the same. It's a rebuilding of hope. It's a rekindling of old gifts and a kindling of new ones. So if you go back in Bible times, scriptures that I read at the beginning, Timothy had become the leader of the church in Ephesus. And he had gotten tired. That can happen when life weighs you down. Timothy had a stomach problem of some kind. It was a chronic physical problem and it wore his strength down. And it began to affect him emotionally. Probably the result of the stress of people picking at him because that's what was going on. That's what happens to pastors. People picking at him. And something in him had begun to burn a bit less brightly. And he began to lose hope. And he began to lay down his gifts to the Spirit so that his ministry was diminished. And I understand how he felt. So Paul wrote to him. He wrote to him twice. And this is what he said. 1 Timothy 1.18. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight. There have been prophecies spoken over me. Prophecies spoken over this church. Prophecy spoken over a whole lot of you that have yet to come to pass. And what Paul was telling Timothy was, fight the good fight in, according, you know, in, in accordance with the prophecies that have been spoken over your life. Pick it up, Timothy, I know you're tired. Pick it up, Timothy, I know you're hurt. But pick it up and fight the fight according to the prophecies, not according to what the people have been saying or what the people have been doing, or according to your physical ailment. Fight the fight according to the prophecies that have been made by you, or made over you. 2 Timothy 1.6 
For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So he's saying the gift is there. The anointing is there. It hasn't gone anywhere. It can't be revoked no matter what you've done, how you feel or where you've walked. No matter how long ago you laid it down, if you laid it, if you laid it down, or how far you've wandered, it remains and it's waiting to be fired up again. And it's all intertwined with hope. That means don't look back. Look forward. Hope draws us. You know what hope does? It draws us forward into the future. And it's a future that God has ordained. You've been empowered. I believe a part of what Paul was trying to do was renew Timothy's hope that life and pressures and criticism had taken away from him. Hope draws us forward, not backward. Hope draws its light from what is before us, not what lies behind. Timothy needed to look away from what had happened to him and what people had done, and he needed to look again at what God had laid before him. Now, for those of you who have kind of felt out of it, as if these things, these revivals, these renewals have happened and you just didn't belong, or maybe you missed them altogether, I want you to know that you, again, I'm going to say it again, you've been held in reserve for something to come soon that's more glorious than anything that went before. If that's not true, then God's not God. You've been held in reserve. Maybe you've been trained and prepared by what went before, but what is truly yours is yet to come. I spent Friday with the people who said a lot of amens and shouted a lot of hallelujahs while I was preaching. God reserved Moses. God held Moses back, held him back till he was 80 years old before making him the man who brought, the, who brought plagues on Egypt, who set the people free, brought water out of rocks, made bitter water sweet, parted the Red Sea, received the law of God, <laughs> held him in reserve. He was, for 40 years, he was herding sheep in Midian. He sent the apostle Paul to Tarsus. So what happens is, you know, Paul gets converted on the road to Damascus. Jesus shows up, knocks him on his keister, blinds him, and then tells him, you're, you know, you're my servant, you know, this is Jesus you're persecuting. So he goes into Damascus and he has this wonderful, glorious revival time, arguing the Pharisees down and leading all kinds of people to the Lord. And then they begin to threaten his life, so he escapes through a window and God exiles him to Tarsus for 14 years, making tents. And so what happened here is God held him in reserve, held him in reserve until Barnabas called him to come to Antioch and get launched in his destiny as the great apostle. Damascus was the old move of God for Paul. It was all Jewish. Was, those are the people he talked to. It was all Jewish. But the new move of God took him to places he'd never been before that he'd never imagined, took him into the Gentile world and took him all over the Roman Empire to lead people to the Lord and to plant churches. You know, there's no record of Paul leading people to Jesus or planting churches while he was in Tarsus making tents. No record. And you want to wonder, you know, was, was he looking back to that wonderful time in Damascus wondering what happened to it and, and longing for it to come again? We don't even read of a church in Tarsus that I can think of. Was he, was he losing hope and longing to redig that old well and recreate that season? Or was he looking forward into the new thing God was about to unleash in his life? You have to wonder, did he lose hope or did he look forward to, or, or, or did he look forward to what was yet to come? Even if he didn't know what it would look like when it came. See, hope feeds life from a God-ordained future into the present. And if that future isn't good, then God has resigned from being king of the universe. If you're hoping that God will recreate something he did yesterday, you'll be disappointed. Hoping for yesterday's blessing isn't hope. It will only disappoint. If you define or measure or judge the way it looks today by what God did in the past, you're going to come up hopeless. You're going to be blinded to what God is really doing. 
To be perfectly honest, some of that's gone on in our midst. Get all wrapped up in what we don't see God doing, and then our hope gets sucked away, and then when God begins to move, we can't even feel it. How many of you know what I'm talking about? See, if you define or measure or judge the way today looks by what God did in the past, you'll come up hopeless. Romans 5, start at verse 3. Not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope, and hope does not disappoint. Hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so, yeah, there are trials and there are troubles and there are setbacks, but embedded in every one of them is the outcome in strength to persevere through tough times and character that's been seasoned and strengthened, and from that comes hope that draws us forward and not backward. So we're not looking at, we're not focusing on the trials, we're not feeding on the past. We're drawn forward into a future. Hope draws us Hope draws the future into the present. And if we're feeding on or we're longing for the past, or we, you know, the, 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 past, the, the past is going to suck us into stagnation and depression and disappointment. 1 Peter chapter 1, start at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance. See, this is hope looking forward. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. What hope does is it keeps you living forward into a glorious future, not backward out of your past. And hope is alive. And the nature of life is that it grows. And so hope grows. God isn't into recreating that past. He's into moving you from glory to glory. Ephesians 1.18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. So, in other words, I pray that you can see with your heart so that you will know what is the hope of his calling What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Hope focuses to the future. It focuses to what is to come. It focuses into an inheritance God pours out. doesn't feed on what was. God is good. His love is infinite. If that's true, then the future, our calling, what we move forward into, can only be ultimately good. And the only way we can mess it up is by living out of the past or by trying to recreate old wineskins that have outlived their purpose and their season. God, God, God will not fill old wineskins. Why? Because they break. Because they can't contain the new. Besides which, he's a creator, and he's obsessed with creating new things. I mean, sometimes just go through Scripture and count how many times the phrase new song occurs over and over 1 John 3.3, 3. Everyone, everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. If we hope in some concrete outcome, if we're, f- I want you to hear that clearly. What we do, what, what, what wrecks our hope is we get some idea of what it's supposed to look like, that we it came out of our own minds. This is what it looks like. This is the outcome I want to see. So if we're fixed on some concrete outline, some specific thing we want to see happen, then the outcome will always fall short and we'll experience disappointment. And disappointment then leads to unclean thoughts and unclean feelings. And those unclean thoughts and feelings then blind us to the blessings God chooses for us that will be better in the end than anything we could have dreamed up. One Christmas, a young man dreamed up in his own mind something he wanted from his parents as a Christmas gift. And he had placed his order. He'd let them know what he wanted for Christmas. That was his picture of what a wonderful Christmas would be. That was his picture of what love would look like. 
His parents knew that what he'd ordered up would last only about a week or so, and they wanted something better for him. They knew that he loved music. They knew that his boombox was broken. So they got him a really good boombox for Christmas that had great sound. It would last him. It would bless him for years to come. When he opened it up and found it, he refused to use it and would barely speak to his parents for a week afterwards because he was so, he was so angry that he didn't get the thing he'd ordered. Blind to the blessing. If we place, if we place our hope in a specific outcome, the result's going to be disappointment. But if we fix our hope in Jesus, then the outcome will be the one reserved for us that we had not imagined, and it'll bring the greatest blessing and joy. Our expectations will be purified. We're fixed on Jesus. Our expectations will be purified. We won't be blinded to the blessing <clears throat> that God chooses to send. The apostle applied the same principle when he spoke about his singleness. I've heard a lot of single people complaining about being lonely and, you know, does God love me because I don't have anybody in my life and all that kind of stuff. I understand that. I understand. I don't know what I'd do without Beth. I've been married 45 years. Matter of fact, what I say about my wife is, if anything ever happened to Beth, I'm done. I've had my woman. I'm not breaking in another one. So... <laughs> <laughs> but just about everybody longs to be married but if your hope is tied to that outcome then you're either going to be disappointed or you'll make yourself vulnerable to marrying the wrong person and I've seen a lot of that I've seen more suffering come from that than I can imagine the apostle basically told single people to cherish singleness as a gift while you have it Fix your hope on Jesus, not on a specific outcome. And when your hope is fixed on Jesus, it purifies the heart in a way that Jesus himself is pure. That's what the word said. The desire for a specific outcome, you know, then it shrinks to insignificance because he's good and he does what he pleases. And what he does is good and it's love and it's blessing and it's right, whatever that might be, whatever he chooses to pour out, and then purpose, the reason for living, flows from hope in our God who draws us forward into himself. If you're hoping for a specific outcome, you're going to be blind. That, 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 that hope for a specific outcome will bind you to disappointment because it isn't likely to look like you envisioned that it should. Or it won't come about when or how you thought it would. And then you shake your fist at the heavens and you get mad at God and you get dark in your spirit because you didn't, he didn't deliver what, what, what you had attached your hope to and you made yourself blind to the better thing he was setting in motion to bless you. I want my hope fixed on Jesus. I, I don't want to be feeding on negativity. I don't want to be feeding on impurity. I don't want to be feeding on offense. I don't want to be feeding on hurt or I don't want to be feeding on the ways that people disappoint me. Those things steal hope. Psalm 101, verse 3, I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. A lot of religious people get into, be careful, you know, you, you, don't, want, you don't want to look on evil, so don't, you know, don't, don't be watching certain movies and stuff. People have left this church because they found out what shows I was watching on TV. I'm serious. But this isn't about that. That's not what that passage applies to. It's about being fixated on the wrong things. It's about having your mind and your heart focused on things that steal your hope. Because it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, it's what comes out. It's not about what your physical eyes see, it's what your heart camps on. The rest of the psalm defines that because the rest of the psalm is about arrogance and a perverse heart and a slanderer and a deceiver. That's the point that the passage makes. Those are the things I'm not going to camp my attention on. It's the focus, what you choose to camp on. And when the focus shifts to pride, to offense, to bitterness, to old hurts, or criticizing others, and on and on it goes, then those things steal hope. 
They anchor us to the past or they even anchor us to the present so we can't be drawn into the future. It all comes down to gazing into the face of Jesus, hope fixed on him and in no other place. I know that in my own life I've spent too much time remembering things that wounded me or hurt me remembering things that didn't go well or prophecies that I haven't seen come to pass or ambitions that were unfulfilled and the result was disappointment and disappointment leads to depression and depression leads to self-focus and self-focus closes off the sense of the presence of God and robs joy. Smothers real love. But hope fixed on Jesus, on Jesus alone, cleanses the past, opens the eyes, scours the heart clean of what's unclean, and it draws us forward into the things that have been reserved for us. Hope fixed on Jesus purifies. It causes everything else to melt away until only him and his purposes remain. And the result of that is the healed relationships we all long for. The result of that is heaviness lifted. The result of that is families restored because we've been purified. The result of that is ministries released, manifestations of the presence received. The result of that is being freed up in worship. The result of that is destiny and purpose realized. We know why we're here. Why am I here? Why did God put me on this earth? Well, he put me on this earth to fulfill his purpose. There's a reason that he created you and sent you into this earth. And part of the message today is rekindle the gift that is in you if you laid it down because it's not over and it's not in the past. It didn't expire. There's a hope set before us. The past isn't going to come again, but the future is reserved for you. Strike a match to real hope. Get drawn forward into a glorious future that can only get better and be more satisfying than anything you have ever known. That is what is before us. God's going to pour out the greatest move of his spirit the world has ever seen, but it's not a repeat of what he's done before. It's not going to look like that. It's not going to feel like that. It's not going to function like that. It's going to be different. It's going to be unique. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be clean, holy, healing, and restorative. It's going to be full of love beyond imagining. I can't say that I really know what it's going to look like because if I did, I'd muck it up. But I know that it'll be stable. I know that it'll be consistent. I know that it won't be crazy. I know that there'll be some serious manifestations of the presence of God, but I know that those manifestations won't be where the focus falls. The early church was more, a lot of people don't get this, the early church in the book of Acts was more wowed by the love than by the, they were more wowed by the love they shared than by the signs and wonders they saw. And it was the love that drew the masses of people to come to know Jesus. And I'll read it to you, Acts 2, start at verse 42. And I want you to notice one reference to signs and wonders, but add up all the references to love and sharing. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, means they were eating from house to house, eating together with each other, and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many signs and wonders were taking place through the apostles. The awe came before the signs and the wonders. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need, day by day continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so in Acts 2, you get more attention paid to the love and the sharing and the togetherness than to the signs and the wonders. And it brought favor, and that favor drew the masses of people. And what I'm saying is that something like that is coming. 
And we need to be open to it. And the battle in our culture has been between the forces of darkness that would focus us on ourselves and isolate us from each other and the force of the Holy Spirit who would draw us together and cause us to love one another and long to be with one another. Purified fellowship. Presence of God resulting from hope fixed on him that purifies our hearts. And here's how I want to end this today. I want you to, if you need a renewal of hope, I want you to stand up. You need a renewal of hope. Stand up. Right where you are. Stand up. Yeah, look at this. Look at this. I want you to reach out and touch somebody next to you. Yeah, just take hold of a hand, put an arm around. So in the name of Jesus, I rebuke that spirit of hopelessness. In the name of Jesus, I want to impart this morning a new view, a new focus, a fresh focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you'll pray this with me, Lord, we surrender our picture of what it should look like. Yeah. We surrender our specific ideas. And we choose to receive what you would send. That eye has not seen and ear has not heard. We trust you, you're a good God. We receive from you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Some of you can sit down. I want some other, I have another question to ask. If you need to rekindle a dormant gift of the Spirit or a calling that you've laid down, I want you to stand up. You need to rekindle a dormant gift of the Spirit or a calling that you've laid down. Okay? All right. Now, if you're near one of these people that just stood up, I want you to gather, some of you who are still sitting, gather around them and lay your hands on them, would you? I don't want anybody left without some, somebody's hands laid on them. Yeah. Thank you, God. I was just going to pray for a rekindling, but the Lord says, no, there needs to be a repentance. So this is one of those repeat after me as a group. I've, you know, I've never, I haven't really done this before, but I'm doing it today. Lord, I repent for laying down my gift. And I receive your forgiveness. And I commit today that I will pick up the gift which is in me through your Holy Spirit. I will rekindle it and I will walk in it for the sake of your kingdom. And for the sake of the destiny which you have given me. In Jesus' name. And so Lord, I pray right now for those who have, have buried prophetic gifts. And I call those things to life again. And I pray for those who have laid down healing gifts. And I call those to life again. And I, I, I pray for those, Lord, who, who have laid down creative gifts. And I call those to life again. Gifts of music. Gifts of worship. I call those to life again gifts of ministry, the gift of being able to hear and counsel. I call that to life again in the name of Jesus. There's a long list. I can't even think of them all. The evangelistic gifts, I call those to life again. And I break the shell in the name of Jesus that has settled over some of us that causes us to walk through the world uh, not seeing what's around us that we could touch and minister to. I break that shell in the name of Jesus. Lord, touch your fire to it right now in this moment and burn it up in Jesus' name. And Lord, let that new anointing, that new thing come upon us as a people. And Lord, we, we'll just, we're so hungry, Lord, we'll lift up our hands and we'll just receive it like the filling of a cup. Let a fire start here. Let it burn this city down. 
In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And I love you more. And I love you more.